And Hello, I'm everybody. What you're doing, Dave? <laughs> Hello, everybody. As as you can see, we've been uh, we've been having a, an active chat already. So so uh, we'll, let's get right into it. Uh, my name is Dave Neary, and this is another episode of Open Source and Business, a speaker series where we ex uh, explore the a broad role of open source across the entire industry, and not just focusing on the software industry. And today, I'm pretty happy to 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 be uh, joined by Nithya Ruff, who's the executive director of the Open Source Program Office at Comcast, and also the uh, chairperson of the board of directors of the Linux Foundation. Welcome, Nithya. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Dave. And I'm also joined by Gil Yehuda, uh, who is the Head of Open Source Engineering and Technology at US Bank. Welcome, Gil. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so the topic for today is the role of open source program offices outside of the software industry. And when we were talking before, before we went live, uh, one of the things we talked about is, you know, what does it mean to be a technology company? And, you know, why does a company like Comcast or a company like US Bank need a an, an open source program office anyway. I mean, you're you're not exactly well. Certainly, Comcast, I guess, in the communication industry, depends a lot on software. But a bank is hardly a technology company. Would you agree, Bill? Well, in some ways it is. In some ways it isn't. I guess if if we were storing gold in the in the basement in safes, then yeah, you know, we just need good safes and good locks. But um, your money is a digit. In a, in a database somewhere, really. So it isn't a bar of gold in the basement anymore. It's a digit in a database that gets moved. So in some ways, we are a tech company. And in some ways, we're, we're not a tech company. And that, I think, is is um, is why we have a, an open source program office, is to sort of resolve that duality of being not a tech company, but uh, everything depends on tech. Um, well, so about Nithya, what exact? Why do? You, why would you say Comcast felt the need to create an open source program office? What was the? What was the need that was being filled there? Uh, that's a great question, and you know we are a media and technology company, so there are some parts of the company that are more in the creative space, but uh, digitizing that creative process is becoming very, very relevant to getting to market faster, better, cheaper. And customers are looking for more digital engagement with companies. So it's very normal for our customers to say, I need an app to manage my internet that you provide or to manage you know, the uh, channels that I have or to stream the content that you provide. So the digital uh, experience is extremely important to our customers. The third aspect is there's a huge, huge part of Comcast, as you know, which is a telecom and telecommunications company uh, managing one of the largest networks in the world. And so that certainly requires a lot of technology. And even networking is becoming more and more of a software driven, intelligent business rather than just a hardware business. So for all of those reasons, um, you know, it, it does make sense to lean into open source, lean into software, and enable our businesses to more effectively serve our customers. So are you primarily um, a technology creator or a primarily a technology consumer? Or do you think there's like a balance of both? What are you, um, you know, how much open source are you using versus creating? That's a great, uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of us use a lot of open source. Uh, in the beginning, when we made our transition to being a software company and an open source company around, you know, the 2000s is when we started, you know, using more open source, um, we were more of a consumer. I think as we grew, we started contributing. Uh, some of it was upstreaming changes but original uh, products and technologies that we created inside the company, like a content distribution system or a set-top box, et cetera, we are contributing those back uh, to the industry because I think we do some cutting edge work in our industry of media in open source. And so this is very useful to other uh, people in the media industry. And then we are also developing more confidence now to start contributing to infrastructure projects like Kubernetes, like Prometheus. So recently we contributed Kuba Healthy, 
and Trickster to the CNCF sandbox, which allows us to add to infrastructure projects, not just the media level projects. So are most of your contributions around, around infrastructure projects that you're consuming as part of your providing the telecom service? Yes, that would be fair to say okay. that uh, most of our contributions are around infrastructure projects. And then some we are developing confidence to kind of start doing more media level and industry level uh, contributions as well. OK. Uh, Gil, I noticed that your title is head of open source engineering and technology rather than head of uh, an open source program office. Um, can you uh, enlighten me whether that was a conscious decision or whether it's a you know, what's, what's, what's the open source program office story at US Bank right now? Sure, sure. So uh, good observation on your part, by the way. Um, it was a conscious decision. And, and I think it reflects where we are uh, in, you know, where we are at US Bank in terms of the journey. Um, you know, as, as I was listening to Nitya talk about some of the contributions she's making, I was heartened because not that long ago, um, in, in a previous role at a different company, uh, I got to work with Nitya and some of the folks on her team and, and really in a similar area of contributing the technology that everyone wants to use, creating that technology. Um, where, where we are at US Bank is a really different uh, place in, in that spectrum, in a place where we don't yet have a formal open source program office, hence my title not being director of the open source program office. It's not, it's not something we have in place yet. It's something that we are um, building toward uh, and and hopefully um, hopefully soon um, to roll one of them one of them out. Um, in our initial stages, we're you know we're transitioning from the kind of organization that looked at build versus buy decisions. You know, do we build something on our own or do, do we go to vendors? And if we go to vendors, what's the relationship with those vendors in terms of our software infrastructure? And looking now at open source as an opportunity to create leverage in that build buy decision. So where it's built, it's not built from scratch, but it's built on top of open source. And where it's buy, it's not buy from uh, vendors that might lock us in, but buy from vendors that are based on open source that give us the flexibility and actually them the flexibility to do some sort of composition of that technology with, with other vendors or other use cases that might not have been on the radar initially. Um, that, that flexibility creation um, it takes a lot of structural work to an organization that, had, that hadn't really been built around that. I mean, they'd really been built around really more of the traditional approach to, toward IT as an asset or software as an asset that you acquire. You either build it or you buy it. Um, it's so, interesting. Uh, yeah. um, a okay. couple of weeks ago, I had um, uh, Carol Payne and Larry Gritz from um, Netflix and, and Sony Picture Imageworks um, talking about the, the evolution of software in, in the film industry. And they also brought up this build versus buy model. And, and there was there was a very definite trend to in, in the film industry toward studios collaborating on common infrastructure, things that were not necessarily useful outside of the film industry, things like color models and timelines and uh, you know uh, scene descriptions and all of this kind of underlying infrastructure software that enables studios to collaborate together. Are you seeing banks start to collaborate on common infrastructure software? At the yeah, point, or is that early? Yeah, no, apps. So yes, I'm seeing I'm seeing banks First of all, recognize the opportunity to do that. Second of all, execute or begin to execute on that opportunity. You know, there's this whole thing around open banking and open APIs. Um, you know, wherever you happen to bank, you probably have all types of features in, in your favorite bank that allow you to do things like Zelle or, or to sort of transfer more seamlessly between accounts where previously that was harder to do. And a lot of those are, are um, enabled by some of the more open standards uh, there, there are financial service open source uh, organizations. Finos, for example, um, is uh, is um, a foundation under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation that's focused and brings together a lot of the the retail banks, but also investment banks, or primarily investment banks, I think now, uh, on looking at open source uh, infrastructure opportunities, sharing data models, and also sharing regulatory compliance. Um, you know, ways like as a regulated industry, there's a whole bunch of things we can't do unless our regulators say you can. And all of the organizations are in the same place, saying 
and this sounds like such a good idea. How do we convince them uh, of the value of that? It's actually more secure, more stable. We should be working together on that. Um, doing so, a we we have the we recognize that there's an opportunity. B we're beginning to uh, execute on that, and C. Um, much like I'm assuming with the studio industry and with a lot of industries, in order to do that effectively, you need a trust model. You need a way to work with your competitors uh, and to explain to the maybe more risk averse people in the company that you are working with your competitors and you're sharing what is appropriate but not what isn't. And that you're not sort of crossing an, over any like antitrust, you know, you're like you're not crossing over any lines. You're doing the right thing the right way. Um, right. And open source and open standards provide a framework to begin to even have that conversation because the open source industry has been collaborating with competitors for well over 20 years, effectively doing that in, in all types of tech industries. So we can do that too. So have you seen uh, both of you, um, the rise of industry consortia uh, like Finos, like uh, Open NF, OPNFV or, or uh, or the open, or what was the Open Networking Foundation at the Linux Foundation? Uh, have you seen that kind of initiative be used by your companies as a vehicle to collaborate with competitors um, without falling foul of antitrust frameworks? Is that is that one of the purposes or one of the one of the benefits of of these open source consortia? I, I I'll, I'll add to that what what uh, Gil said. I, I am seeing that in the uh, film industry and in the content creation industry, as you know, Academy Software Foundation uh, has been created to do exactly that for the film industry and to kind of digitize the pipeline of uh, content creation. And, and to Gil's point about trusted models, open source has created really trusted models of collaborating across companies. And I think foundations take it one step further by providing a neutral home where companies can collaborate and they provide all of the infrastructure components and the legal aspects and community building and ecosystem building, et cetera, so that we can do that. I think companies are getting smart about uh, enterprises, which are not in the software business, are getting smart about where to collaborate across the industry and where the value add is uh, and where they can focus on the value add. So uh, yes, I do see more and more. And the Linux Foundation networking is what I think you were trying to get to. Yes. Um, which, right? which is also disaggregating a lot of the technology stack around the network um, and, and really clearly delineating places where we can collaborate and places where it makes sense for people to add value. And, and I would say, to, uh, just that uh, in my in my industry, I think that we're seeing the opportunity and we're seeing some activities. Uh, I would admit that it is not the go-to model. It's not, you know, it's and it's not wide and, and pervasive. Um, at least where where I am, where someone says, "Oh, this is a great opportunity for an open source collaboration with a competitor. Let me pick up the phone or go onto Slack and talk about this." Um, I think that there still is a lot of activation energy that is required to determine that that's the appropriate thing to do. But we're beginning to see that that many times it is and that we can and that it's OK. So um, where we are is at the early stage of getting our feet wet. Um, we have a bunch of things that are happening, but it's not that it's not that, you know, of course, behave. Of course, we're going to call up our competitors and, and you know, spin up a Slack channel and, and go for it, you know, with right. GitHub. You know, it, we're not there yet. But the but the the beauty is um, for those of us who are on that you know if you remember the Jeff Moore crossing the chasm curve you know so so for those of us who have who have been really at that cutting edge um, and have blazed the trail and have made a bunch of mistakes along the way in sort of creating the appropriate trail the rest of the industry that's sort of on the other side of the gap saying okay now we're ready organizationally and you know relative to our infrastructure priorities, competitive, uh, you know, observations as well. Now we're ready to sort of cross that too um, and to walk on those trails. But there's some exercise that has to happen in order to be fluent at that. And, and we're, we're doing that. I think you bring up a really good point that different enterprises and industries are in different uh, stages of the maturity curve, if you will. 
uh, or the adoption curve. Some are laggard, some are early adopters, some are mainstream. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's that's what we, we are saying, uh, Dave. It's, I have a feeling that we're going to have some interesting metaphors today. <laughs> um, so w one of the things that I've, I've like crossing the chasm, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that OSPOs are, uh, are often used as a way to help organizations across that chasm. Uh, so would you kind of class yourselves as professional chasm jumpers at this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? I, I, I think a lot of chasm jumping uh, a lot of uh, assuring people that this has worked before, this is okay, and sharing knowledge of the cultural aspects of of the future land, if you will, and how to work with that land, and uh, what does that mean? What are the business benefits of uh, doing this crossing the chasm, uh, connecting the benefits to the business of the company, uh, all of those translations, I think, are so important to make because it's not, as Gil was saying, it's not a natural action one takes if you're in another business. And so you've got to kind of translate and connect uh, between why it's important and how it connects to the business. And one of the patterns I've seen in the industry at large, and, and, and definitely I think, Nithya, this is true in Comcast, um, is that companies are are being a little bit more thoughtful. Everybody has their internal technology. Everybody has technology that they've built to do their business. Um, and companies are becoming increasingly thoughtful about, is there any differentiation in this technology that we've created? Could it be useful to other companies? Is there a way for us to open source this and get other people collaborating with us on this and perhaps reduce the cost of maintenance over time, perhaps get other benefits in terms of hiring? Is that something that um, I, I assume that's something, uh, Nithya, that you're increasingly being involved in conversations uh, around? I know that there are several projects that have been open sourced by Comcast that really just came from internal development. Exactly, exactly. I think um, the level of thinking and the level of sophistication improves in a company when you introduce open source because you're always thinking about where is the value line? Where is the line where you know something needs to be open versus closed? And where what do customers pay us for? What do they value? And um, it's also temporal to, in my mind because sooner or later, even that value line keeps going up because that becomes commoditized as well or that becomes you know more generally available. And so there are a lot of great discussions in terms of if we are first to market in opening this, what are some of the advantages and do they outweigh the advantages of keeping it closed? And uh, so I, I love the fact that open source really creates that kind of discussion at our open source advisory council where teams come in and submit things that they want to contribute. First of all, they do the thinking in their business itself the business unit says, I think we should contribute this. And the manager or the GM or the VP of that business approves it. They then bring it to the Open Source Advisory Council where we have a great discussion, a multi-dimensional discussion across uh, our IP legal team, our commercial legal team, our uh, security team, our open source team and our technologists, like fellows and distinguished engineers to say, where is that value line? Is it okay? And what are the business benefits of doing this? Um, so I love that kind of conversation because it really makes us focus on the things that matter to our customers. So I'm curious, I'm gonna dig in a little bit on this. Um, what level of burden, what level of preparation do you expect from people who are proposing projects to be open sourced? And uh, you know, what does the, the advisory council do in terms of like, do you expect a business plan, some kind of success metrics? You know, how do, how do you evaluate whether whether something is is going to um, be a good open source project? We expect the business to have thought about how that fits into their business strategy, and uh, does it make sense for their business to open or close it because they are closest to the business as opposed to us. So they have to come with a leadership approval. B, having thought through whether it's good for the business. Uh, C, that they have time to dedicate to maintaining this once it's open sourced. Uh, 
And I think Gil will agree, a lot of us agree that we don't want to just throw it over the wall and just let it sit there uh, as code. So we specifically ask that they can have time to commit to maintaining it, building a community, uh, et cetera. We also ask to see if uh, this really belongs in another project outside, which, which has momentum, as opposed to being an independent project on its own. Um, we are not in, because it's, it's a heavy lift when you are a brand new independent project, as opposed to say, uh, being part of a, an existing project because it's a new feature of that project or belongs in that ecosystem. And then, you know, we advise on license, we advise on uh, best practices in how to host a project such as README and contribution guide and all of the hygiene that goes into having a good uh, project. So those are some of the considerations uh, we put to it. You know, uh, let, let me add to that because, you know, I, I, I admire Nitya, we, we've known each other for many years and, and, and I'm not gonna disagree with, with what you said, but Dave, for the, for the show, I wanna show a different perspective and say, like, I disagree, there's another as aspect to it. So I don't disagree, but there's another aspect to it, um, which, and, and I'll tell you over the past 10 years, I've helped open source hundreds of projects and yes. of those hundreds of projects, you probably didn't hear of hundreds of them because a lot of them didn't succeed, but some of them did. And some of them that did succeed, you absolutely heard of, and many of you are using them in your companies today, including um, we're using some of those projects that I open source uh, from my previous company, it's like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember publishing that. I remember getting that into the Apache incubator. I remember when it graduated as a top level project. Oh, I feel so proud. Um, but I also remember hundreds that didn't. And and because of that, um, I, I have a slightly different perspective in terms of the bar that we set. Um, I think that, that when you go to open source a new project, you have to have sort of this honest conversation about what your objective is. Not everything is going to be the next Hadoop or the next Spark or the next Storm. Some things will be, but some things are going to be, uh, they're gonna have smaller impact, but they're still good as long as you understand what that impact intent is and your investment in it. And in fact, I'll go even to the extreme. Um, and the extreme is, and I, I used to play this game uh, a little bit in my last company, and I'm hoping to play the game in my current company because it's a great game. I would go to engineering teams and tell them that I've identified their project as being a candidate to be open sourced, and they should prepare because in a few weeks, we're going to take their code and to publish it as an open source project. Okay, I just say that. It's not true, but I tell them that. And what happens is, is then I, I check the Git stats afterwards. They add documentation. They rip out all types of libraries that were never used. They add text cases. They make their code better, right? And then a few weeks later, I say, well, you know, we changed our mind. We thought it was going to be good, but like whatever. Twitter open source something even better. Good, like whatever. Um, the, the mere threat, the mere promise of, open sourcing your code forces engineers to think about leveling themselves up. So even if you don't publish it, or if you publish it and it doesn't become the next great, you know, centerpiece of, of every open source blog and discussion, even that, it's still going to be a better set of code that you use, that you rely upon. You've improved your code by merely suggesting to the uh, engineers that their peers at other companies will look at their code and, and have opinions about it. And suddenly they evaluate themselves, not just on the successful completion of the build script to turn something into a binary that passes test cases, they evaluate themselves on the quality of the code they put into it. And, and open source does that to engineering, I, making you a better engineer. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and in fact, um... I, I just wanted to add to what you said. Uh, I, I totally agree that not all projects are created equal. So one of the things that we are trying to also do is to do a tier one versus tier two. And tier ones get a lot of high touch and love from the OSPO. The tier twos are you know, acknowledged just feature functions, libraries, et cetera. But I also wanted to add something to what Gil said I think if, when uh, developers start a project inside the company, if we advise them to start with open in mind, as you said, thinking that one day it is going to be open, the behaviors are very different, as you said. 
it creates a, a much higher quality of a project. The code, the documentation, the modularity, the componentization, the APIs, et cetera, become uh, more built for collaboration, more built for high quality. Uh, and I love that you did that. And we are trying to kind of encourage people to think open when they first start the project, even if they never go open to your point. Um, is there a danger, uh, Gil, that um, for people who know peanuts, that you know eventually Charlie Brown will stop trying to kick the ball? Uh, <laughs> no, no, there isn't. There isn't because um, engineers generally, the engineers that I, that, that I typically work with and I get to experience, seek to become better engineers. Uh, we, we, you know, we want to. We all want to be better at what we do. Open source provides a modality that forces us, first of all, to be humble enough that somebody else is going to look at our code and bold enough to share our code, right? And that combination of I'm, I'm, I'm confident enough that I'm going to put my code out there for you to look at and humble enough that when you issue that pull request, realize, you know, when I realized like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that, that situation that can happen. That combination refines engineers to become better engineers. And, you know, when when in sort of traditional or enterprise companies, engineers are focused on a delivery date. Like you need this functionality by the date within the budget and here's the amount of time. It's a very focused sort of engineering activity. But if at the same time, as they're doing that, they can refine their skills, then they get better and the organization has better engineers. It's like, it's the win-win that everyone wants. And you get that win-win even if you don't put any code out there. You get it even more when you do put code out there. So I, I think that when you look at the spectrum of open source publications, everyone wants to have the, the next big thing. And those big things really are game changers in the industry. But even the little things provide value to um, improve engineering excellence. And as much as an OSPO is a chasm crossing tour guide, let me show you how to do it. It's also part of the engineering excellence uh, intent of an organization to ensure that where they're investing in technology they're getting the best out of it they're they're using the right technology and building the right skills within the engineering uh, ranks to ensure that they can leverage their whatever they're building for the long haul because they they can they know it yes so i have a question from salona um which i'm going to ask and add to because you've both talked about cost benefit analysis um, Nithya, you've talked about that as an important aspect of uh, the conversation about whether to open source something. Um, so Silona asks, how can OSPOs help address that cost benefit analysis for the company? And my addition to that is um, one of the things that I've, I've observed is that the things that Gil, that you talk about, adding the documentation, improving the APIs, et cetera, are often seen as part of the cost of open sourcing. How do you overcome that? Uh, in your in your analysis of the cost benefit analysis, and say, well, actually, these are just things that we should have been doing before. These are things that are related to the open sourcing. Uh, exactly as you said, Dave. It it is uh, it elevates the quality of engineering. It elevates um, the software development skill sets. It elevates the leadership uh, of our engineers. Uh, they have to be good communicators. They have to be good influencers. They have to be good. Uh, leaders. Um, and so I think the cost is very minimal compared to the benefits we get of a higher quality of engineering, higher quality of development and retention of our people. To me, uh, open source work is a huge uh, adder to retaining engineers inside the company and uh, growth of our engineers inside the company. So for instance, in the um, engineering ladder, uh, we often say, if you want to go between principal engineer and distinguished engineer and fellow, you need to demonstrate that you can think about open source, you can contribute to open source, you can uh, get engaged in open source projects. Uh, you sit on the open source advisory council, you are you know, guiding uh, engineers in the use of open source. So those are just as valuable as, uh, say, getting a patent in the company. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefits to, which you know, Gil pointed out very, very effectively, uh, 
and and I think inner source also builds on that. It says, "Hey, company, you know, if you use open source practices of, uh, co you know, collaborative development inside the company, you shall gain so many many benefits, even if you don't practice opening the projects or contributing the projects. You're breaking down silos. You're reusing. You're uh, you know, improving software across the company, you're leveraging experts across the company. So to answer the question, the benefits are pretty explainable in terms of engineering competency, retention, development, um, collaboration. So on the flip side, how do you evaluate the costs? Because there are costs to open sourcing, right? I, I, like a project that's open source with zero resources, <clears throat> zero time, zero engineers, nobody who loves it will fail. Uh, so how do you how do you balance the benefits with the with the costs? Like being honest about them. Let me let me let me see if I can sort of redefine costs a little bit because I think that sometimes we look at costs. One of the well, let me back up a little bit. One of the changes that that the software industry had years ago that we have to remind ourselves of is that the cost of software is not in the acquisition but in the total cost of ownership, and that's yes. sort of like oh wow, you know. This is a dynamic thing as opposed to a static thing, and but still today, you know, I, I meet people who are looking who are looking at evaluating software choices the way they evaluate which digital camera to purchase. You know, they have a spreadsheet of features and of like, and they have like these Murphy balls with like you know green and red and whatever circles filled in with these features, and they try to find the in the most features you know for the for the price. And it's a very sort of static model. And when you think of cost that way, then you get what I think is an inaccurate view of the cost of things. When you look at software as a dynamic system, a growing, you know, um, plant, uh, you know, a, like an organic system, um, you know, then cost becomes ongoing support. It goes, it's the investment to maintain. Um, the cost of a car includes the cost of the oil change. And if you only budget for the car and you don't budget for the oil change, then you'll have to budget for replacing the, the engine or the car, right? You, and and if and docu so to your question, documentation, um, in, you know, improving modularity, removing code that isn't being called or libraries that are no longer being called because of refactoring, all the sorts of things that you should do uh, need to happen in order to manage the cost of ownership of a project. Now, if Publishing something for open source forces you to, you know, to go through and say, oh, wow, well, let's pay down some of the debt. It's, it's like, let's let's actually fix this because we're, we're going to show. Fine. But you're not going to be able to successfully run the project in the long haul without that kind of refactoring or without that kind of maybe lightweight documentation. Maybe, it, maybe the documentation level is increased, but if you had no documentation at all, then you're putting yourself in a situation where you're going to have a difficult time maintaining that software, even if you didn't open source. So if anything, yes. it's it forces you to come to terms with the total cost of owning the asset over time, rather than um, how do we justify the investment of a cost? It's going to cost us, you know, a tech writer three weeks. Um, are we going to get three weeks worth of tech writer back contributions from the community? Like, if so, then we offset the cost. That, I think that entire framing um, is based on assumptions of the static nature of software, which which we've demonstrated as an industry doesn't adequately capture what the real cost of managing software is, which is in the flow of managing. So, very well said. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, very well said. And, and in the choices that we make also between commercial software and open source, we are trying to frame it in that same fashion to say it's not just that the acquisition cost of open source is free. There are so many cost of ownership issues that you need to think about, but also so many benefits you get because you now can modify it and maintain it as opposed to having a static asset. Um, and yet those conversations happen, right? That, that, that I've been in the room in conversations where um, we don't have time to do the documentation in this sprint, so we can't open source the software. Um, so, so those are definitely seen as part of the cost of open sourcing in general. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, and, and, and I'll, I'll 
add another angle to this. In fact, incomplete software is okay to open source because then it gives the community a chance to contribute and to be involved and to feel a sense of pride in completing it. So I remember very distinctly when I worked for Wind River Systems, we were working on the Yocto project, which is now an embedded system and it's out in the market. Uh, we specifically called it you know, revision 0 0.9 before we released it. And we specifically left certain issues unresolved so that the community will get a sense of completing it and, and getting to 1.0. Um, so another question from Silona. Um, in standards, uh, we have many processes to prevent corporate dominance. Many businesses understand the business importance of working on those standards. What can open source governance learn from standards governance processes? Would that help the corporate world feel safer? Gil, I don't know if you want to take it. I, I have some perspectives also. Uh, please, you know, please. Um, so, so I think foundations were set up to create that neutral ground. Uh, to make sure that one particular uh, company does not dominate. Apache takes pride, in fact, in making sure every project has at least two or three, you know, main contributors and not just one contributor. And the health of a project really should be measured with the diversity of con contributions coming into the project as opposed to one big dominant uh, company or contributor being involved in that project. So I would highly look at the diversity of contribution. I would look at the TOC and how the, the technical um, committee to see how broad the list of contributions are. Um, and also the P players in the TOC, players on the board, making sure that we have a lot of different perspectives represented in all of these. And, and a lot of uh, foundations work very hard to do that. And I know sometimes you can be dominated for by pay for play, where you have maybe platinum members dominating uh, a certain board as opposed to everybody else, but that's the role of the executive director or, or the person running the foundation to make sure that user perspectives are heard, smaller company perspectives are heard, uh, and balanced with the platinum members and uh, and the other large uh, perspectives. Sure, I'll, I'll I'll just add to that based on sort of my experience um, in in some cases where good intent didn't play out, like where there were where there were um, challenges. Uh, I would say, and to Salona's question, like if an organization wants needs to feel comfortable with a particular involvement, whether it's open source or open standards or really any sort of engagement they need to look at the specifics of the the actual case that they're trying to be involved in and not overgeneralize things. Because uh, like the general open source model and the general open standard model and the general open source foundation model uh, sounds all nice and good, but a particular community with a particular set of um, issues as it intersects with a particular company may pose enough conversation that it's worth actually just talking about that and not over generalizing and say oh I don't trust the open source model or what can the open source model learn from open standards thinking oh, open standards can learn from open source I don't know it kind of goes kind of goes both ways sometimes right um, but if an organization is uncomfortable with something uh, let's let's talk about what that thing is because there may be very specific issues that would help bring comfort but it's sort of a generalized solution obviously isn't enough to bring comfort. So, um, you know, sometimes in engineering, you have to say, I don't know what the pattern is, but let me just look at the source code. Like, let me look at this specific source code in this specific file, because maybe the bug is not part of a pattern, but it's something very particular. Um, so that's what I would do. I will note that um, we had a complete episode on, on uh, open source and standards and their interaction with Salona from IEEE SA Open and Guy Martin from Oasis uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, also on our YouTube channel, shout out there. Um, in addition to what you all have said, I would, I, would, I would say that it's okay to have single vendor projects, um, that it's not always a requirement that, like 
it's part of the conversation, that honest conversation about what are your goals for your project. Do we need other companies to engage with this project to justify open sourcing it? In that case, then you need to have a very, very hard look at what's your project governance? How am I going to onboard other people? What are the other companies that care about this type of technology and how can I get them involved? Um, but sometimes, sometimes you're open sourcing for some other goal completely. Like maybe you're open sourcing a mobile operating system because you want to make it easy to onboard a lot of uh, OEMs that are developing phones and, and uh, uh, you know, you, you want to get a, create a, an ecosystem that's going to challenge a, an incumbent. In, uh, that's kind of Android challenging iOS. iOS. Um, so it, it depends on your goals and, and sometimes it's okay. I think that's very well said. Sorry, it's very well said. Uh, the community for each project is so different and the intent is so different. So it's okay if it's just for ecosystem building or it's only appeals to a specific community of people. And hence you won't find, you know, the whole world engaged in that project. And then there are those broader projects which everybody wants to use and be involved in. It's okay. Yeah. So changing tack a little bit. Um, You've mentioned through the conversation, we've we've heard that there are a number of stakeholder groups that you uh, you work with: um, engineering, legal, business leadership. Um, so, who who would you say are your key stakeholders in the organization? What are their concerns, and how do you work with them to allay or address those concerns? I'm so uh, glad you didn't ask which ones I like better than the others. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could certainly ask that if you if you don't want me to. Um, Nithya, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure, sure. Uh, I, I just went through this exercise recently because I was trying to re um, kind of focus on who is my target customer? Who am I trying to serve? And what problems do they have? And how do I serve them well? Uh, at the heart of the core customer for me is the developer. And our existence is about making it easy for the developer to do their job uh, in using open source and contributing to open source and distributing open source, complying with open source and, mm -hmm. and leveraging open source to develop as an engineer to kind of, uh, you know, develop strategies around it. So to me, that is the core of what we do as we are a developer relations organization. And then uh, peripherally, we have to serve their managers. We have to talk to them in the language that they understand as to why open source, they have to make room for open source in their organizations. And the cost benefit discussion we had, you know, why is it a benefit to their organization to make room for open source? Leadership gets it um, and they understand the meta aspects of open source as an enabler of innovation, enabler of cheaper, faster, better in the organization. Um, but you still need to remind them every now and then of uh, what the importance of open source is, how you measure success, and do they agree with those measurements of success? And is it tying to the business goals and the business objectives of the company? Uh, so to me, that's, uh, that's the problem set. That's the, the core uh, audience. Do you find yourself working a lot with uh, purchasing and legal around um, SLAs for open source projects, figuring out what the right vendors to work with are, um, allaying kind of some of those uh, risk mitigation, risk analysis concerns? Yes, uh, we have we have a really really good relationship with legal, and and uh, you know Gil will attest to this. Um, one of the the best relationships you need to establish is with your legal team your commercial license and technology licensing team and your strategic IP and your patent team. And uh, I work very, very closely with Mindy, who is our uh, commercial licensing team to make sure that our supply chain agreements are correctly put into place and that we are looking at our relationship, you know, in terms of distribution and um, in terms of uh, contribution, um, you know, notices, right? In, in software bill of materials, uh, 
uh, in terms of, um, you know, how they deal with open source. So open Chain, for instance, has been very instrumental in us kind of trying to educate our supply chain of the best practices and compliance that they need to follow and work with us. So, yes. Yeah, and similar, similarly with me, I, I work with, we have uh, an excellent, uh, we call it the law division, but our legal team. Um, and we have a, a risk management uh, infrastructure as well, which is separate um, from the law division. And that's because uh, as a bank, that's part of the, the structure is that there's like a, sort of a, a three level risk uh, management infrastructure. Um, there's information security as an infrastructure. Um, there's enterprise architecture uh, as an infrastructure and they provide governance and, uh, and, and sort of the higher level architecture blueprints, the solution architecture, there's the actual DevOps teams. Um, and then, you know, really there's a ton, there's tons of, um, of organizations that each have a role in ensuring some part of this to make sure that this is a complex system. The clarifying point that I think that, uh, that Nick just uh, had in, in her answer, which I love and share, uh, is, is really who are we serving? And that I think is really one of those major differences between OSPOs or organizations and how clear they are in terms of who are they serving? Who's the customer of the OSPO? Is it the business or is it the engineering community or is it um, some other entity or, or are there multiple masters? You know, And if there are multiple masters, do they have shared goals or uh, parallel goals, right? So like for instance, this is sort of the classic challenge that sometimes organizations have with their inf infosec, their information security teams uh, is, you know, there are those organizations that have allegedly had infosec people saying, if you can do your job, I didn't do mine good enough. You know, <laughs> like I'm here, to, I'm here to sort of like stop you, you know, cause yeah. you're rogue and my job right. is to stop the rogue engineers from being successful. And you say, well, so you have that kind of behavior in, in, in some less functional organizations, but as you know, in more functional organizations, you have, no, I'm actually here to help you, but I'm going to introduce a concern that maybe not be top, that maybe isn't top of mind for you, but should, but is top of mind for me. And I need to elevate. And I think that OSPOs, do that with respect to how do we use open source strategically leveraging how do we use it legally how do we use it securely how do we use it in, you know consistently with our with our architectural uh, architectural standards so we all work together to serve a common purpose the the challenge though is articulating and agreeing on those on that common purpose so that we then operate together i think that leads nicely into paul berg's question that he just asked in chat which is uh, what, in your opinion, is the most effective organizational division for uh, an OSPO to live in? And what are the contrasts? Should it be under legal, marketing, engineering, business operations, purchasing? And I think you've partially answered this with your question, um, Gil, which is, you know, who is your primary customer? Right, right. So, you know, I've, I've been in a couple of organizations. I've, I've run, you know, I've, I've been in a bunch of organizations already. Um, running open source, or in one case, opposing the running of open source earlier in my career when I wasn't a believer in the open source movement. I, you know, please forgive me, but it's true. It's been converted. Um, <laughs> learn. Right. But I, you know, I, I acknowledge the sense of my youth. Uh, but I've been in organizations, and it, it's my, I've seen it in a couple of different places. And as uh, as open source program office leaders, we have actually collected a bunch of different models once we went through this exercise where we went through a couple of models to say, well, how do you have it in your company? And you know, what, what is good and what is bad about that? I think, I think like reporting to the CTO, uh, reporting in the engineering organization uh, is, is the, you know, the office of the CTO, the office of the chief architect, the, you know, some sort of dev ops shared service, enterprise service sort of org that provides services to engineers works better than um, if it's like in marketing or or in legal. I don't think it's, I, I really don't think it should be in legal, although for many organizations it is. I think it needs to maybe start in legal, but then move out into organization and have a partnership. Um, so there we go. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's best in engineering. Um, to me, it's best in engineering because my customer is the developer and we are working in tandem as opposed to if I'm outside of engineering, trying to tell engineering what to do. It just doesn't work. 
And there are so many intricacies involved in trying to get engineering to buy into automating their compliance in their workflow, for instance, which requires being very close to engineering and having consistent goals. Uh, it requires, you know, understanding what you're using, what you should contribute, what, what kind of um, engineering methodologies you should use. So uh, it really makes sense there. The second best place is the CTO office, I think, which is slightly removed from day-to-day -day engineering, but is responsible for elevating engineering practices, creating consistency of practices across the company. And that's where I sit. Uh, inside Comcast, I'm in the CTO office in a group called Software Strategy and um, Transformation. So it's very charter is to find, uh, you know, common platforms, common technologies, common ways of working, elevate engineering practices. And I agree with uh, Gil, I've seen models where uh, companies put it in marketing. Perhaps it's because uh, the big need in that company is to elevate its image in open source. And so it needs to work a lot on that as opposed to, you know, other things. I've seen it in legal very much in the old days of open source program offices. I think it's evolved now almost, you never see it in legal. And then we see, uh, uh, Gil and I have seen it um, scattered across the company, like a group of volunteers working together, coming together, versus not a centralized group, and, and they make it work. Netflix, I think, has a, a very decentralized uh, volunteer-run model, and it works for them. I've never seen an OSPO that's uh, reported through uh, line of business, uh, like business unit leaders or uh, mm -hmm. product uh, management teams. Is that... Um, it's almost curious to me that I've never seen it because it seems like a natural fit for some companies or for some uh, projects. Um, uh, have I just not have have I just missed it, or does that not make sense? I think conceptually it may start there because that particular business unit has a huge open source involvement, either in the product or in in some other form. Uh, when I was at Sandisk, for example, it started in the enterprise group because the enterprise group was innovating in open source more than other groups were. But then soon it moved to centralized engineering and became. Uh, a common resource for all of uh, engineering. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, also, there's also sort of the related, uh, uh, real quick, um, there's sort of the cast the cast model where, where like, a, you know, a double cast itself is a long or something, um, where you have somebody who's technically reporting into the in a business line, but they are acting as if um, they are, you know, a central service. And that's just because of the 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 structure of the organization that there isn't maybe a hook for them so the ospo is like if you look at the org chart it looks like they're in a product line of business but if you look at the way the ospo is operating it's operating as if it was one of those kind of things so that's, what that's I'm yeah yes that's such a good point that's such a good point because uh, in comcast um we have a lot of other entities like dreamworks and nbc universal and sky and while i sit inside cable um, I do uh, relate and work with the rest of my brothers and sisters across the entities because, uh, it, you know, we are the biggest OSPO in the company. And so we help them uh, with any open source questions that they have. Okay. We have so much stuff that I would love to discuss, but uh, so I'm going to pick the, the highlights here. Um, uh, first, uh, can you give me a quick word on how your organizations view inner sourcing? Is it useful? We have an episode entirely focused on inner sourcing with Denise. Cooper and Isabel Dross from next week, but um, uh, just briefly, do you do you have an opinion on inner sourcing? Is it is it open sourcing light, or is it something that's really beneficial in terms of cultural change for engineering teams? We absolutely have an inner source practice in our open source uh, group. We work very closely with Inner Source Commons and Denise, uh, and we find it extremely helpful because when you're a very large company, you have a lot of uh, groups that should really be collaborating together and there are common components that should be reused and so we are indeed finding it very valuable whether it's a, as a stop to open source or as a destination by itself 100 uh, percent inner source is not open source light inner source it, inner source is yet another expression of 
how to best manage software. Some of it needs to go, some of it is inner source, some of it is open source. There's a categories of software that aren't going to be open source, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to be uh, potentially inner source. And there's categories of software that might not be appropriate for either, 100%, but um, it's not an open source light. It, it is another manifestation of an intelligent way to deal with software assets uh, as as a system rather than a static thing. Okay. Yes. And and another highlight. So you've both worked in multiple companies across multiple industries. Um, are there commonalities, common obstacles that you've seen across your your life experience, and how have you uh, kind of um, gotten past them, addressed them, worked around them? I think one of the, the most important things to do is to understand the business the company is in and then tie what you're doing to the business of the company. So at Sandus being a storage and a hardware centric company, I had to find where the meaning of open source fit into the company strategy and have a sponsor and a champion for that strategy and work with that strategy. The challenge always is middle managers because they are under pressure to deliver uh, for the business and making time for security, making time for DevOps, making time for you know, open source and all of us who come to them to include it in their thinking um, is a big lift sometimes. And so that, that's been a challenge. Yeah, for me, the common, the common challenge is that change is hard um, and that technology forces change. So like, we're in the business of change, and yet change is very difficult for human beings to do. It usually implies a loss of control or an inversion of control from the business controlling things to IT folks controlling things. And and, and in some ways, I kind of wish I had a degree in IO psychology, like I, because there's so much of this job that really is about organizational psychology and helping organizations deal with the rate of change in technology, in addition to the nuances of the open source of development model and licensing compliance and all that stuff too. Yeah. Yes. We are collectively human beings interacting with each other to do stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so let me finish up with uh, a question about how you see the future. Um, so if I were to broadly categorize the last 30 years in open source, the first decade was um, hobbyists developing open source. The second decade was uh, technology companies, uh, open source uh, the software companies embracing open source and learning how to do it better. And this last decade has been about enterprise outside of the technology sector, um, adopting and evolving their use of and uh, adoption of open source. Uh, so what do you see coming in the next decade? I, you know, I, when I started in 98, uh, it was enterprises felt it wasn't safe to use open source, but we've come a long way, baby, as they say. And uh, um, it's, it's very much accepted in enterprises. I think it's now going into verticals and solving problems for healthcare, for energy, for finance, for governments, et cetera, and, and kind of becoming hyper-focused um, on the problems of that vertical and how to solve for and the role of open source in solving for the vertical. Um, the other area I would say is what, you know, Gil touched upon. I think it's, it's going to become part of engineering practices. It just becomes everyday engineering and um, best practices in engineering as opposed to this add-on or this new thing that's bolted on uh, on top of uh, you know how people do engineering today. Sure, and, and, and I'll add to that um, an undercurrent of the open source conversation that's been persistent since its beginning has been the relationship between consumers of software and the vendors that provide various vendors that provide the software or services around it. I think that's going to be consistent uh, persisting in the future where the open source um, uh, movement tries to find the right balance of dependence and independence with respect to its vendors, which is why you see this rise of like new non-open source compliant licenses um, and, and really vendors trying to position themselves in ways that are both open source but, but not sort of simultaneously an organization trying to say well we want to like we want to use open source but now we're going to pay all this vendor you know all these vendors to support the open source but wait how was that better like is it is did that change anything 
Um, so I think that the future is still dancing between users of software, creators of software, and vendor support of software to find that right balance of um, you know, sort of symmetric control over the future uh, of software. I really like uh, Nick, your observation that um, you know we're seeing increasingly verticals like go changing from I would say the last decade has been about adopting open source and uh, you know how do we adopt it more strategically and make sure that it fits our needs um, but now we're seeing it go to line of business addressing specific technical needs and open source becoming you know almost the standard way that that industries collaborate on on common infrastructure I'm looking forward to it me too yeah well, I'd, I'd like to thank you both for joining me today. Uh, this has been fascinating. This has been a brilliant conversation. Um, as I said, next week we have a session on um, uh, how inner source can accelerate culture change with Denise Cooper from Nearform and Isabel Drust from, from Europace, who are being hosted by Leslie Hawthorne, my colleague at, at Red Hat. Um, and, and we're going to really dig into you know, the, the benefits of inner source in terms of uh, organizational change. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Gil. Thank you, Nithya, for joining me today. I'll be getting this up on YouTube on our channel. Um, please do sign up to our newsletter so that we you, you stay informed of future speakers as they're added to the schedule. And uh, I look forward to seeing you both in the future. Thank you so much. It was such a fantastic conversation.